Good morning and welcome here. From wherever you are, we're so glad you could join us this morning. We just have a couple announcements that we'd love you to hear and be connected with. Uh, the first is this is almost summer. We were just talking this morning about it's not quite the temperature yet, but it sure looks like it outside. With summer comes the need to be taking care of the property here, and we're looking for some people who would be willing to be mowing the lawn here over the summer and spring months. If you're interested, you can find contact information for Damon in the announcements. Please connect with him. The more the merrier. We'd love to have you join us uh, as we care for the church property here. Uh, the second is... We just want to let you know we're looking into and moving towards doing something with an outdoor service. I can't give you the details yet because we're still working the details out, but we wanted to let you know that the details for that will be coming in the, in the coming weeks. I want to open this morning in a word of prayer. Father God, you are good to us. And you care for us in ways that we don't understand. We want to thank you for that. We want to praise you for that. We want to praise your son this morning for his love for us, for his involvement in our lives, for your ability to change who we are to be more like him. In your holy and precious name, amen. Amen. Um, we just now want to invite you to worship um, with us from wherever you are. Um, let's just worship together through music.
Communion feels different when you're doing it at home, maybe alone. But this is not something new in the church. When we've gathered together, we're still just a small part of the body of Christ in the world. As we celebrate communion this morning, this is something that the church has done for thousands of years. And as we celebrate, we join with the host of believers that for thousands of years have remembered Christ's death and his resurrection and its power in our lives. So as we join in communion this morning, join with the family of God as we celebrate what he's done for us. If you need to pause the video to go grab elements, feel free to do so now. I promise we'll be there when you come back. Let me pray. God, I thank you for Jesus, for his life and his death and his resurrection on our behalf, that he died so that we might live. God, sometimes we repeat the truth of that so often we lose sight of the reality of it. Don't let that happen for us. May what we do next be a true celebration of your involvement and engagement in our lives. In your name, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Jesus, I thank you for your death that we might have life. And I thank you for the power of your life now in us and changing us, transforming us to be like you so that we might have the same communion you have with the Father. Amen. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. His blood shed for us. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have the good news of the gospel, which is essentially the declaration of new life from spiritual death. And baptism is a symbol of the new life that we have in Jesus Christ through the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. 
And I'm really excited because today we have a dear brother in Christ, Tyler, who's going to be baptized. So Tyler, I want to invite you to come on in and, and share with us. Yeah. Okay. So hi, my name is Tyler Stevenson. I was born and raised in a Christian home. I accepted Christ into my heart at a young age. And it wasn't until a few years ago that I started to really understand what a relationship with Christ means. Baptism is something that God commands us to do. It is a declaration of what God has already done within me. This has been on my mind for quite some time. And today, I'm finally done procrastinating. I'm happy to finally be taking this next step in my walk with Jesus. So Tyler, I have a couple questions to ask you. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Have you repented of your sin, and are you trusting Jesus to save you? Yes. Have you trusted him to save you, I should ask? Yes. Yes. And you want to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. And you are here to publicly declare that? Yes. So Tyler, based on your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is exciting to see people take those steps of faith. I'm going to ask you to do something a little different this morning. In fact, I'm going to do something a little strange for an online thing, and we're going to, in a minute or two, give you a few seconds of dead air. I want you to take a moment to think about your life, to think about the people who have had influence in your life. Is there someone in particular you can think of that has helped spark your interest in God? I'm not asking you to figure out who was the first influence, influential person for faith for you. I'm not asking you to figure out who was the most influential person. I'm just asking, is there someone who comes to mind when I ask, who helped spark your faith or interest in God? And if you have a few names that come to mind, that's fine too. When I first started to work on this message, I sat down to make a list for myself, and it didn't take me very long to have a dozen names. And as I've thought about it, I just keep adding more to the list. Men and women, young and old, friends, family, some of whom were barely acquaintances, and at least one on my list whose name I don't know, who the encounter that had impact on me lasted a few minutes at best. But it's a story that has shaped how I think about God and how I think about his people. Some of the stories of the people you think of are going to be people who have been a steady influence in your life for years. Others, their stories, they connect sporadically but regularly over the course of your life. For some, that influence is gonna be merely momentary, but each of them have had a profound impact on life for you. I want you to give a few moments to create your own list, to remember the people that God has used in your life, whether that was people used to draw you to faith or to encourage you in dark times whose lives were models of what a Christ follower looks like. You may remember them for the questions they asked you and the way they challenged you. You may remember them for the example they gave or simply for the, the steadiness of their presence as they pointed you to Jesus. So who is on your list? Who has God used to stir up your faith Take a few minutes, no, take a few seconds to remember their names and the story of their influence.
want to take a moment and pray to thank God for those people and for their influence on our lives. God, our lists are too short. It's too easy for us to overlook all the times that you've been at work, to miss the uncounted times that you've used people in our lives. But thank you. You have been so good to us, so generous in putting these gifts, these people, in our lives. Thank you. Thank you for loving us and for giving us these relationships. Relationships that put hands and feet and words and deeds to your love for us so that we might know you more completely and more fully than we did before. Amen. I want to take a few minutes this morning and look at how God used some of the relationships in the life of the Apostle Paul and what we might learn from the stories of those relationships. We'll start in Acts chapter 9. Let me summarize the first 10 verses for you before we begin reading in verse 11. Paul, whose name was originally Saul and only later changed his name, is an enemy of Christianity, what he calls the followers of the way. Saul has been leading persecution in Jerusalem. He's been involved in the arrest of many and the death of at least one, perhaps more Christians in Jerusalem. He's now been given official religious permission to take that persecution north out of the city to Damascus. When he gets there, he'll arrest any Christians he finds and bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. But just before he reaches the city, he's blinded by a bright light. He has an encounter with the risen and ascended person of Jesus. And he's profoundly changed. And he's taken into the city, still blind, and led to the house of Judas, not the Judas betrayer, another another guy. And there Paul sits in the city, unable to see for three days. We continue our story in verse 11. Uh, Verse 10. And there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, I will start again because I have lost my place. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is, my chosen inst- he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food he was strengthened. The first thing I want you to note from the story is the brevity of this relationship. Ananias walks in, lays hands on him, says, Brother Saul, Jesus 
sent me. He tells him that he's here, so Saul will have his sight returned. Scales fall from his eyes so that he can see. It's implied that Ananias then baptizes Saul. And then, nothing. That's it. For Ananias, we don't even have an exit stage left. He disappears from the story. It's the same one chapter before. God tells Philip, go out and stand by a certain road. And he's picked up in a chariot as a conversation about the book of Isaiah. Baptized as a total stranger, and then the story's over. The point isn't what these guys did. The point is that God is at work. He's at work before they ever enter the story. It's not that they have elegant words. It's not that they have powerful things to say. They have a powerful person to point to. Before Ananias ever enters the scene, Saul has already had a vivid encounter with Jesus on the road outside Damascus. Before Philip climbs into the chariot, the eunuch is already wrestling with the meaning of Scripture as he reads Isaiah and trying to understand what God is saying. So while the relationship is brief, the impact is not. It's funny how this works. Impact is often felt in just one direction but can be entirely missed going the other. In my preparation for my message this week, I wrote a list of names of people who have had influence over my spiritual walk. And so I made a phone call this week to somebody on my list, somebody I have not talked to in almost 30 years. And 30 years ago, we knew each other for just barely eight weeks. But through the glory of the internet, I found a phone number. The impact I felt, the impact he had on me, was profound. I witnessed a, a love of scripture up close and personal. I watched him struggle through real issues of the application of scripture in his life. And what I saw shaped who I am. But it's funny, I, I, I called simply to say, thank you. Thank you for the impact that you had on me, for the influence your relationship with God had on my relationship with God. But it was a few weeks of his life 30 years ago, and he didn't remember me. He did remember my dad, and as he shared with me, I discovered he remembered my dad because the same sort of impact he had on me was a similar sort of impact that my dad had had on him. I've shared the story of how God shaped me through that encounter 30 years ago many times. But it seems for him, this far in the past, it, it doesn't even register anymore. I, I, don't, I don't know what Ananias expected when he got out of bed in the morning. I, I don't know what he anticipated. I don't know the impact that he thought he might have. Uh, but I'm fairly certain... It wasn't a meeting with such a dangerous man and seeing him come to faith. It was a small act. It only became large because of the impact that Saul has down the road. I don't know how you get out of bed in the morning, but if you're like me, or at least a little bit like me, it's not often enough that I get out of bed in the morning with an anticipation for how God is going to use me in the next 24 hours. Instead, I get up thinking of the, of the list of things that need to be done, of the obligations I might have that day, of the schedule I might have to keep, or of the play that I might get to participate in. But if Ephesians 2 is correct, that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we might walk in them, if those words are true, and they are, then we ought to arise each day with a sense of anticipation for the opportunities that God has arranged. 
now. Now, perhaps not immediately, when you first get out of bed in the morning, some of you need coffee. Some of you might need a shower. Some of you might need something else before that you're ready and capable of feeling, well, human. But that anticipation, that curiosity to see where God might be at work, that should be real in our lives. Ananias got to be involved in a world-altering event because the man he spent time with, Saul, changed the world. That should not be our expectation. Like my phone call this week, most of these events, most of these engagements, they're forgettable for us after the fact. But the impact they have echoes in the lives of the people that are touched. And not just here and not just now, but that echo can last through eternity. Ananias is available to be used by God. And however briefly, he impacts the life of Saul. For some days, Saul stays in Damascus and continually shares the story of Saul and shares the story of Jesus and shares how those two stories connect. And he does this sharing in the synagogues, which means that it's for the encouragement of the Jewish Christians, those who are gathering daily or weekly in the synagogues to hear Saul is there to tell them the story of Jesus and how Jesus has changed who he is. But it's also a direct challenge to the Jewish religious leaders, those who operate the synagogues in which he's going to speak. And so those leaders and their followers plot to have him killed. But the Jewish Christians get wind and they lower him in a basket outside the city and he escapes. Acts 9 makes it seem as if he flees from Damascus and lands in Jerusalem. But when Saul, who later becomes Paul, writes the story of his life in the book of Galatians, he says that, that three years pass before he arrives in Jerusalem. That first he flees to Arabia. Some traditions have it that he goes to some sort of gathering at Mount Sinai. And from there he returns to Damascus when the heat there has cooled down and they're not out for blood anymore. This is Acts 9, 26 to 28. And when he had come to Jerusalem after those three years, he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem and preached boldly in the name of the Lord." So when Barnabas brings him to the apostles to defend him, it's not simply the few days they had together in Damascus with Saul sharing his story. It's not simply that he's heard what happened on the road outside the city, but it's years of time together to which go to, to proving the testimony, proving the story. And there's significance in the word here, or in the wording here. Barnabas doesn't merely stand up and defend Paul when someone among the apostles makes an accusation against him. It says Barnabas actively brings Saul before them and gives him his endorsement. The phrasing here seems to get, indicate that, that Barnabas has some sort of recognition or, or authority within the church. And, 
the fact that later they're going to send him to Antioch to go investigate what's going on reinforces that idea. The common suggestion is that Barnabas becomes Saul's mentor in ministry. Perhaps his mentor in faith, I expect. That's true as well. And it's not just here that their lives intersect. After, after three years of proving, Barnabas brings Saul to the church in Jerusalem to gain their endorsement as well. And when he gains that in Jerusalem, he preaches and he teaches among them for a while. And he does this until at some point he makes enemies again. And so the church sends him from Jerusalem to go home to Tarsus. Sometime later, the church, the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas to Antioch. They tell him, go investigate the Gentile believers that are joining the church there. Figure out what's going on. And so Barnabas, remembering his friend, recruits Saul to come join him, not simply to investigate what was happening, but together to spend a year in Antioch, preaching and teaching, so that some would come to faith, and those already following the way would be built up. At the end of the year together, these two men together are sent to Jerusalem as a representative of this church to deliver financial relief there. The church in Jerusalem is facing famine. And again, it's sometime after this that these two men are at the church in Antioch, which seems to have become their home. And the church in Antioch appoints them as missionaries and sends them out to Cyprus and modern-day southern Turkey to plant churches and to teach others about Jesus. These two spent years together. At first, I imagine it was training and experience with, with Barnabas taking the lead and teaching Saul the ropes. But it developed into a beautiful ministry partnership that lasted years together. With Ananias, the story we get is of a, a one-off event. God used him in this pivotal moment of the story of Saul's faith. With Barnabas, the story that we only catch glimpses of is one that unfolds over years together. With Ananias, the first question is this, or the first question we should ask is this, am I intentionally available for God to use in what seems like brief and often random, or at least seemingly random, encounters that I might have today? Do I make myself available for God to use? The second question is the other side of that. Are my eyes open to the place where God is using those seemingly random encounters to encourage or direct or draw me closer to him? With Barnabas, the question is different. It's not about whether you are available for action, but have you taken action? The relationship there is intentional. Barnabas joins to Saul. He seeks him out. Have you found yourself a Barnabas or three for your own life? That may be mentors in your life. That may be partners in ministry with you. And not simply people that you do ministry around, but people that share the highs and lows of ministry with you. The joys and tears and struggles of ministry together. Perhaps more generally, the question is this. How can God use the relationships you have right now for the sake of building your faith? Have you surrounded yourself with people who are there to encourage your faith, to point you to him? Or perhaps more personally, how are you allowing God to use the relationships you already have to deepen your faith? 
it's very easy for all of us to allow our relationships to be defined by our interests, whether that's books or sports or engines or tools or even coffee. We're drawn to people who share a common interest, and none of that is wrong. But the question is, how can you use a relationship that's seemingly built on a shared love of, say, football, to instead enjoy that shared love of sports, but be built on the desire to help each other to know him more? Those relationships focused on our growth are important for all of us. And they don't happen unless we are intentional, in, intentional about seeking them out and making space. Years later, after Saul has become Paul, you see these sort of relationships continue. Timothy, Titus, Silas, Mark, and others. In the same way that Barnabas has poured into Saul, now Paul pours into these other young men for the purpose of seeing their relationship with God grow deep. And I suppose this question seems important, especially right now. In a time when our gatherings are very limited, where, where we don't see each other like we're used to or like we want to, how do we make space in our lives for the relationships that deepen our faith? Many of you, my included, have a phone in your pocket. It makes phone calls. While a conversation over the phone isn't a conversation at Timmy's and isn't a conversation in someone's living room, those conversations over the phone can still be used to deepen our faith. And whether it's the telephone or Zoom or email or text or Facebook Messenger or with the improvement of our weather, it's the sitting on a back deck for coffee or going for a walk in the park. It seems to me all the more as our normal points of connection and encouragement aren't around us, that we need to find space to allow God to use our relationships to deepen our faith. We need to find space where iron can still sharpen iron. Before Saul and Barnabas left on their missionary journey, they brought aid, as I said, to the famine-stricken church in Jerusalem. And, and when they returned, they brought back Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, and they included him in their ministry. So when they set out on their journey together, they brought him along. But shortly after the journey began, John Mark abandons them abandons the trip, abandons the mission, and heads for home. Saul and Barnabas worked together for more than 14 years, but in the end, they divide over the person of John Mark. This is Acts 15, 36 to 40. And after some days... Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought it best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. There's no denying that this disagreement was heated. There's no avoiding that anger was involved. You can't ignore 
that what had been more than a decade of successful partnership was undone by this argument. But was it? What had been one team of missionaries is now two, able to be in different places at the same time, able to cover more ground, able to have more flexibility in responding to need. And I imagine the smaller size also makes it easier to escape the city when the people of the city decide to stone you. There's no denying that the disagreement between these two people, these two friends, was sharp. But just a few years later, when Paul writes of Barnabas in 1 Corinthians, it's, it's not with antimosity. He doesn't write with a sense of antagonism. He writes with a sense of solidarity. Are Barnabas and I the only ones that can't be paid for our ministry? He's saying we stand together. We may be apart, but we do the same thing. While we may no longer serve in the same place, we remain part of the same kingdom, and we serve the same king. Paul certainly reconciles later with John Mark. He instructs Timothy, go get John Mark because he's so helpful to me. Bring him here. Perhaps his reconciliation with Barnabas was unneeded. Perhaps, though they sharply disagreed with each other, they also realized the advantage of expanded ministry. And even if they didn't realize it, God certainly did. God used the opportunity of their disagreement to increase the effectiveness of their ministry. With Ananias, the question was, are you available for how God wants to use you or for how God wants to speak to you? With the first 14 years of relationship with Barnabas, the question was, how are you allowing God to use your relationships to de deepen your faith? With this incident, the question is this, are there relationships in your life that need to change? Not because they're sinful, not because they le might lead you into temptation, but they need to change to create space for further ministry to happen. Someone else off my list, I only met her once, and none of the conversation was profound. In fact, the memory that impacted me wasn't from her life. It was from her funeral. And strangely, it was from a funeral to which I was not even invited. I heard about what they did from her son, who had later become a friend of mine. Her son had a, had a Lego brick, and, and it had a hole drilled through the middle of it, and it was attached to the keychain for his car. And that seemed a little odd to me. I didn't think he was a huge Lego fanatic, so I asked, why do you have Lego on your keychain? Apparently, they'd handed them out at his mother's funeral to remind everyone of something that she had taught, and I've said this before because it stuck with me and impacted how I think. We are all Lego bricks. And though we come in different sizes, those sizes representing the different capacity we have for relationships, we're all of us limited in that capacity. Which means that all of us choose what bricks we attach to and what bricks we don't. Paul and Barnabas had served together for years. They were well-attached Lego bricks. They had continued over those years to invest a whole lot of time in each other. This disagreement divided the friends. And though they remained connected, it wasn't as completely as before. But this change made room for new relationships. And we see the evidence of that in the number of young men that Paul disciples and brings into leadership in the coming years. 
The relationship between Paul and Barnabas wasn't wrong. It wasn't bad. It, it was good. But I think maybe that it had served its purpose. Paul was ready to, to stand on his own, to lead by himself. And he needed maybe the room to stretch his wings. If the first two questions were hard, this one's much harder. Whatever your capacity for relationship, it's easy for us to fill that space with people we like, or maybe entirely with our family. Now, neither friends nor family are wrong. Neither friends nor family should be discarded, but perhaps the space they occupy needs to be changed. It might be that you need to make room for a Barnabas in your life. It might be that you need to make room for ministry in your life. It's likely that you need to make room for relationship with people that aren't followers of the way. Not so that they can become your project, but so that through a relationship with you, Jesus can have influence in their life as well. I believe I heard it this way a number of years ago. The average Christian, within five years of coming to faith, ends up with no non-Christian friends. Either those friends have already become believers themselves, or they haven't, and the relationship seems to have drifted apart. If we don't go out of our way to intentionally make room on our Lego brick, it's not going to happen on its own. If we don't intentionally make room in our daily lives for God to be at work, how, could we be, how can we expect God to use those moments in our daily lives for our growth? If we don't intentionally make room in the relationships we already have for conversation that drives us towards God, how can we expect God to use those relationships to help us grow? If we don't intentionally make space in our lives for new relationships that God wants to bring our way, how can we expect that God will use them to help us grow either? And there's one more relationship I want to touch on, and only briefly. And it's not with a particular person for Paul. It's the antagonistic relationship that Paul had with the Jewish elders and the Roman leaders. Even opposition can be used to deepen our faith. At times, especially opposition. James writes, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be, so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. Even the relationships that challenge us, sometimes in unhealthy ways, can be used by God to bring us growth. Our faith seems to grow most especially through the trials we face. Not as we complain about those difficulties, not as we embrace the trials and maybe the people who cause it, but as we trust the author of all creation to give us what we need and to guide us through the challenges. God uses our relationships to grow our faith. As we're available to act or listen to what he would have for us, as we're intentional about using those relationships for our growth, as we make space for the relationships he wants us to have, and as we trust him, amidst relationships that might hurt. God wants to use all of our relationships to lead us to him. Let me pray. God, I thank you for the people you have put in our lives, for that list of names that have had such a profound impact that we can make them a list of names. I thank you, too, for 
all the nameless and unnamed moments where you're at work and we don't see it, to draw us closer to you so that we might know you and be loved by you and be changed by you. Amen. Let's worship together again. Uh, sing, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. What gift of grace is Jesus Christ?
May your eyes be open to the God who is at work in the people around you to encourage you, to challenge you, and to let your relationship with him grow deeper. May your eyes be open to the opportunity that God has given you to be an encouragement, to be a challenge, and to lead the people around you further into a relationship with him. May we know togetherness in a way that is profound, even though we're not together in one room. May that be true for us all. is called.